easiest way. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'm here with uh, Ram or Rameshwar um, ba- Balanagu. Is that correctly? Correct. Right. Balanagu, um, who is an absolutely incredible uh, technologist, CIO, a Forbes technology member, um, one of the most deep set sets of certifications I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, so certified to the gills and everything from enterprise architecture to um, some some AI stuff, a lot of IT certs. Um, so Ram, thank you for joining. Thanks, Mines. And I hope I pronounced it correct. Miles or Aaron? Yep. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I've definitely had people um, uh, get confused because it's like I have two first names, right? Miles, Miles, Aaron. A lot of people call yeah. me Aaron Miles. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, great to meet you and um, excited to have this conversation. So, um, so your main role in tech has been as a CIO, um, a chief in- information officer. Um, for the early stage startups who are watching and maybe less familiar with this role, um, can you kind of share with us, um, you know, how you approach the CIO position? Uh, you'll find it ironic, uh, for an early stage company, you honestly don't need a CIO. You like what, what am I saying? What you need is something like a chief innovation officer, mm-hmm. not a chief information officer. And the reason why I say that is. A chief information has, officer has a dual edge sword. He needs to look forward. The traditional CIO was more like a lights on, who was focused on operating model, making sure all the systems supported the business. There were no escalations in making the business happy. That is what the traditional CIO was. A. Fast forward to this new era where we live the last three, four years, or even this whole AI thing, the CIO is no longer looking into the past, but he's looking into the future now. <clears throat> and that's what I call chief information or innovation officer. Now off late, there have been too many buzzwords like a chief digital officer, chief automation officer, chief AI officer, chief data officer, chief. Yeah, and if everyone's in the C-suite, I don't know, exactly. just so, kind of like the whole company's in the C-suite, correct. right? So <laughs> when, you take, uh, when you take this information officer and buy a call innovation officer, for him to make a decision, he needs data, period no matter what. So are you telling me that you don't need the CIO to have knowledge and data? Excuse me. And then the CIO needs to be risk and secure compliance. The first guy who's going to be fired besides the CISO is the CIO. So he needs to understand security. He needs to understand compliance. He needs to understand the threats. And when I mean the threats, there are the external threats and the internal threats. The C, there's no other person who is well suited to understand what the external threats are, internal threats. And all he's doing is his torpedoing based on his existential knowledge and looking into the future and then helping the company build a business model and IT operating model. So that's why what I say is current CIOs are innovation officers, but when you have a startup, they don't have any legacy debt. They are built out of fresh ideas. Um, I believe you are younger than me. So your brain is fresh, you're building everything. <laughs> so you don't have the traditional legacy debt that we have. Everything is built off the cloud. So so what I call is all you need is a chief innovation officer who, who makes sure the systems that you are building are good enough, but there's no legacy debt for you. So what you need for a young or a early startup is a chief innovation officer. And he's there to help you guide through the waters and build a strong operating model. And so how does the chief innovation officer compare to like, for example, a chief technology officer, like every startup I meet has a CTO. Most of them don't have a chief innovation officer. So maybe you can delineate like where that innovation lens um, kind of differentiates from technology to, to innovation. So uh, before we go there, Miles, everybody uses terms very usually, loosely used to a term set. A course, seed yeah. company a growth company, a startup company, a funded company. Uh, I want to set some things right, at least based on my knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, an early startup is somebody who ba- who barely has an MVP, a product. When I mean, again, again, this is a very generic definition. A minimum viable product is something like two, three customers are using. Yes, it is clunky, it is buggy, but it has two to three customers. So an early startup is, no, we all are young or we have some fancy idea coming out of a paper, we're building it. 
you don't need that's in a very very early startup company for me that has just been bootstrapped by the founders or a little bit of angel investing because in the calif in the silicon valley everybody knows who's who and then they say listen i have an idea great idea because of the relations the days of course the days have gone but there have been days where people got 5 to 15 million just because based on a thought and a paper and i have many right. many cases so mm-hmm. so it's very important for you to define what's an early startup what's an early startup what's a startup what's a growth company and what i've seen in the last 8 to 10 years people use it interchangeably and i specifically ask what is a growth company for me until series b it's period it's a growth company because they are going through the growth pains they are very very fluid things are not proper they are growing and trying to get customers so post series b or series b where the scale starts then it becomes a different so I, i'm just trying to make sure that you know uh, yeah, i think it's important use... to speak the same language and i appreciate that so i i am happy to use that framework for the conversation and um yeah i think you have basically this um kind of mvp stage you're trying to find product market fit you need to iterate a bunch and really you're not going to get those large checks that are i mean not anymore right. of course right. exactly. if, you're, if you're in the right place at the right time like you're doing you know crypto and blockchain was exciting or you're doing uh, uh really on the bleeding edge of ai right when ai right. got exciting then yeah maybe but most cases you're not getting that like growth capital until you've proven product market fit and so you maybe that's series b or series a um but certainly before that we can say pretty much all of those companies are this early stage startup that's still yeah. finding the right use cases they're finding the right market they're finding the right product and features and um to me that's a very exciting part of everything it, of, it, it is it is yeah. so so coming back honestly you know um, when you're in that small stage company it doesn't matter whether you call a cto ctio cpo you know the technology officer itself is a product officer so because they're just handful of people doesn't matter what title you give it doesn't really matter and one more thing what i'll tell you is i agree when you're in this early stage you each one of you are from a janitor to a sales guy period you are selling the company in different ways you may not be a sales guy per se but you are representing the company ethos and you're talking in various ways you know it, it could be a proud moment saying you know i work with this great company as a janitor so i am telling indirectly the world that this is a cool company so i'm not talking about the product and all i'm talking is how cool the company is now if there's a guy a developer sitting in he's just talking of how cool the company is so so honestly in my view if the company in the series a or prior to that whatever title you want to give it's a fancy title it's you know we all get carried away by it including myself you are all focused on only two things or three things product building and marketing and sales point blank mm-hmm. whatever title you want to call it you call it and and actually having a chief information officer is a debt because the guy cannot really contribute it's a growth company they've just built their assets there's not a proper operating model you are trying to live by the book and try to get a customer there's no need for an information officer you, perhaps your cto is your cio too or even he's a cpo too you know we have the chief product officer yeah definitely yeah i think that's yeah, a really so, important and good good point that we don't need to, you know you don't want to be playing house with like too many executives and and pretending that you're a lot larger than you are and really you know you're just building a prototype you're getting out you're rapidly trying to learn and um iterate on that product and and really everybody's wearing most hats like your COO is probably your CPO and your your CFO like your CEO is probably your lead salesperson you know as well exactly yeah. there will actually be conflicts because the sales guy will be expecting only sales but you are saying no no I need to focus on technology so there will actually be conflicts too so the best thing is everybody is acing up their sleeves and saying we're all up for it forget the titles Awesome. So I um we had mentioned some of the certifications before. I think it's interesting that we started out talking about this kind of alphabet soup that plagues some of the early stage startups and 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 we kind of dug in on on definitions and everything and you are actually an expert in this area of um of of kind of um understanding these at an abstract level what an enterprise 
is um, made of at a much larger scale. So your TOGAF 9 certified, your ITIL certified, Enterprise Architect certified, all of these things are about really like change management and managing IT at a very, at a much larger scale. So what are some of the things you learn? Uh, oftentimes we say, hey, you know, startups have to do things that don't scale. They have to think in a kind of a different way than those larger companies. But I'm just curious, what are some of the things you learned from going deep on that um, that do apply at the early stage or maybe inform some of your um, views of how, how you, you can think about startups knowing how enterprises really work? So uh, first and foremost, all these are needed um, A for you to, so I come from the background of enterprise architecture and enterprise architecture is mainly focused about business, IT operating model, which is all about optimization and rationalization. Very simple is making sure how does the value to the customer get delivered on a time with minimal number of systems and clicks and whatnot. So when you take this back to the world of startups, like I said, you know, an early stage startup, everything is an ad hoc basis, but there are basic things called business architecture. Now we're not going to blow the world away. It's very simple. Uh, there's something called a business model canvas. If you have seen the lean business model canvas by Jay Patel, not Jay, he's very famous. Uh, what's his name? Uh, lean, uh, lean Alexander canvas. Osterwalder. Alexander Osterwalder. And there was one more, guy who spoke at MIT. Come on, man, it's not coming up. Uh, whatever. Um, so so very simple, you know, forget everything. What architecture teaches you and why you need a little bit of it for a startup is we call something called a business model canvas. It is like, who am I? What do I do? How do I differentiate? What is the value proposition? What is the cost? So what happens is that business model canvas, of course, you can say, hey, Ramesh, you know, Uber didn't do the shit. They just drew on a piece of paper and they made millions. So they had a simple idea. Great. Agreed. Yeah. But if you see Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines uh, drew on a piece of paper saying we want to be the, uh, what do you call it? the Amtrak, not, not the Amtrak, uh, this, uh, the, the bus company. What is it? Uh, the Greyhound. We want to be the greyhound of air. So they had a very simple message that is a vision statement calling we want to be the greyhound of Airbus. So a point to point stop with no frills and cheap. A simple vision and a mission statement, right? That is yeah. where many of those start buying democratized transportation via air. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So many startups actually when I look they're not very clear on vision and mission. If you are not clear on your vision and mission, that means you have a fundamental problem, what you want to do and where you want to go. This is where architecture actually helps you. Now, you don't want a business architect with a big check or whatnot, but basically the pr principles of an enterprise architecture start with a vision, mission, and goals. What do you want to do? Why are you here? And where do you want to go? Very simple. Your vision, mission, goals. Your goals are more like what you stand for. What's your company? What not? What? So, Based on that vision mission, if you draw a simple lean business model canvas, okay, any investor or even for your team, okay, what do we do? Why are we different? Because if you take this example of generative AI, there are a million companies all trying to do the same thing. The only difference between you and them is a split second where you are ahead of them. But the disadvantage that you have is you do not have the check that those guys have. So what you need is a clear differentiation and when to get in, how to grow and how to get out. So that initiation, growth phase, exit strategy, this is what you can put with your business model canvas or lean model canvas. So that's where you apply. You know, then we can talk about everything else, but at a very high level, this is what business architecture talks about. And this is what uh, the, um, Alexander also talks and everybody, uh, you know, talks about it. Of course, nowadays we have Y Combinators teaching you from your MVP to your cash flow to whatnot, and you need it. You, but, but when you start, basically, if you are not aligned, if you cannot speak the same language, by the way, which is what enterprise architecture says is trying to speak the language of business and trying to speak the language of everyone is equally important. Otherwise, the founder will have something and I myself have personally perceived it. I have been investing in startups I say something, the founder says something, the sales guy says something. So if we three are not aligned. What are we expected to say to a customer? So what architecture tells you is speak 
one language and make it kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, point blank. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, and um, I, I love this idea of taking this hyper complexity that you get of thinking about enterprise architecture and just boiling it down to a business model canvas, key partners, key activities, key resources, value props, uh, customer relationships, customer segments, like knowing your sales Where channel. Where is my cost? Where is my revenue? That's it. Exactly. Everybody understands it. Oh, I get it. I get it. Yeah. And then you just have that one piece of paper. You keep it very simple. You try to get some, um, you know, shared vocabulary with the team. So you're always communicating about the same thing. Um, and then, you know, one of the nice techniques I think people can use with that business model canvas that I, I tried out early on. I can't remember where I learned that from. Um, but the idea was, you know, if you're operating in sprints, then you're trying to incorporate the customer um, feedback into every sprint. And you actually can go and update your business model canvas every week or two uh, because you're moving so fast, right? Like later exactly. on, a little more static maybe, but, uh, but early on that canvas, you could be rewriting a whole box in a week or several boxes. Several know? boxes. And actually I was referring to Ash Moria. Sorry, I just got it. Okay. Yeah. He, he's a, a good, uh, I think he's a guy that every startup has to learn. Um, Ash Moria and Alexander both. Uh, but Ash, I've followed him for a long time and it has been very useful to me. Great. Yeah, we'll put a link to that um, in the description on the video too. I think these are both really great resources. Yes. Um, so you mentioned you've been working with a, um, a ton of startups. Um, do you mind sharing some of the case studies or learnings that you had working with, with one of those? Or, or maybe we can talk about just in general uh, what industries that that you focused on and worked in with those younger <laughs> companies? So it's funny. So um, I work with a company focused on creator economy. Um, okay. I, I don't come from the creator economy world, but um, the founder is a former Navy. Uh, he's a sub. He drives or fly, uh, sub, fly subs. I don't know what is the right word to use it, but... Uh, it's interesting. He lives in nearby. Um, it's focused on creator economy. And, uh, um, you know, I don't come from that world. I never had it, but it's funny. So I was blogging on something like on Uber. And uh, uh, one of the things that I've seen is people um, on YouTube, you have or LinkedIn, you have impressions. So people just look at it and some people like it and some people may or may not comment. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I started my LinkedIn journey around seven, eight years. Actually, my first blog on LinkedIn was I failed in enterprise architecture certification twice um, because I didn't have a method to practice. So I really said, you know, if I want to be an enterprise architect, I need to know where I'm strong, where I'm weak before I prepare for the exam. So if I can't even pass the exam, what is that? How can I be successful in EA? So I actually applied that for my exam. Okay, this is where my strength was and I started working on it. So, um, and I passed with high flying colors, but this was the third time. Normally everybody passes in first, uh, first uh, check itself. Um, I'm an average guy. Uh, so what I did is I took my journey and put it on LinkedIn as how to crack TOGAF, step by step. So it was funny that some people shot me saying, you know, you, you are just stealing somebody's paycheck because you have institutes training people on how to crack TOGAF. And I wrote step by step how to crack the exam in one shot. I don't want people to go through my pain. So anyway, um, as you keep blogging, people keep watching you to see how your persona is, mm -hmm. what you are, what not. And it takes time. So he actually watched me for three years on LinkedIn before he approached me. Wow. So, so, such a, so and he thinks, uh, hey, Ramesh, uh, I want to talk to you and I'm like, uh, okay, sure. Let's, uh, this is my number, call me. Now, when I look at his profile, he's a submarine guy. I don't know anything. And he speaks of creator economy, which sounds Greek and Latin to me. And then I say, for curiosity, where are you? I'm here nearby to you. I said, uh, I'll go and check out this guy if this genuine. And if not, I'll just say bye to him. So my goal was to just meet him and say, thank you. Mm -hmm. I ended up talking to him for three and a half hours. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is such a good lesson for early stage companies that are, I think, a lot of times um, they're working on tech and they're not really getting outside the building. And one of the one of the very good lessons to learn is to um, put yourself out there like you were doing 
you were building a personal brand. So I think brand is really important, like just communicating and, and sharing what you're up to. And I'm honestly, you know, I post a lot, but I'm guilty of not letting people in in the same way. And I think it, it just takes a little bit of effort to get out there and, and share your thoughts with the world. But when you do, um, eventually people reach out to you and then it's your job as a founder, not only to, to say yes to those opportunities, but also to reach out yourself, connect with everybody and have conversations and you never know what will happen. And that's, it's amazing um, how many technical founders are afraid of sales when all sales is, is sharing your passion with people and, um, and, and reaching out and communicating and, and sharing how you bring value. And a lot of times the sales, ha- they just close themselves. Like you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to know every trick in the book for sales. You just have to go talk to people that, that are interested in what you're doing. And at that stage, you have to be human than sales. So your personal building, your branding is what will lead you to drive to sales. I know sales is a very number, a quantitative math number where you put and then start going crazy. But believe me, uh, for a startup, it's all the human relations that matter. And if you have good relations and if you're done right, you will have decent traction. And that's what you need at the early stage. But if you become more pushy and become more sales oriented, they're going to fall flat on your face. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've actually run a test, um, an outreach campaign, one where I led with a kind of a more salesy sequence, really described the value props, said like, hey, here's what I have to offer. Here's the pricing, like blah, blah, blah. Got almost no responses. Then I did another outreach campaign, uh, compare where I just said, hey, how's it going? I like your company. Let's talk. And I got like 90% response rate or something. You, so you, you just come across as human, then people are willing to talk to you a little more. Um, so yeah, I think this is just uh, really important for everyone to hear it. And you know, I was looking at a SaaS, a SaaS business the other day that I think is really promising. And I was doing the unit economics and I was saying, man, you know, this is, a, is $400 a month. And so if you sell, uh, you know, 200 customers and you, you keep 200 after your churn, you've got a million dollar business there, you know? And, um, and when you look at those numbers and it's only 200 people, like if you're in that kind of middle price range where it's not extremely expensive, but more like B2B SaaS, um, yeah, you can, you can manually sell a hundred times in a year. You can do that. You can actually talk to every single one of those customers. Um, and I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to automate and, you know, write out tens of thousands of emails to everybody bothering them. And it's like, if you only need 200 customers, like just get on the phone and, and show up and start talking to people and you'll, um, you know, you're networking even in person in a place like I know you're in Dallas and I'm in Austin. There's so many startup events every week. And so the customers are there to be had. You just have to get out the building. Yep. Exactly. Um, so I had, um, uh, we, before we jumped on the interview, you and I were talking briefly and you said something that caught my ear, um, which is that you're working on a, um, an event related to chat GPT. Would you like to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So I have friends in New York and well across, uh, they have done something called chat NYC. And I said, why can't we do chat It is the, the hottest thing. And, um, you know, um, of course, everybody likes to catch on the hottest thing. But like, uh, if you have seen Satya Nadella's opening show on for the keynote event, he said, we moved from the cycle to the industrial era. This is the same thing that is happening with chat GPT since last November. So we, we jump frog or we leapfrog all the way from the cycle, bicycle to our industry era. This is where it is. The use cases, everybody is now a startup guy. Everybody now is a thinker, an influencer, a blogger, podcaster. Everybody now knows and everybody is now preaching about generative AI. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. Everybody has to have saying that. Uh, but there are parents also. So what we want to do is the event in New York was pretty phenomenal. We want to talk you know, with the like-minded and with the people who have actually been in the industry before the hype came and mm-hmm. talk about, you know, this is all great. The use cases are great. But we also want to talk about the risk management. Actually, I don't know if you follow NIST. NIST has an AI risk management framework, which is maturing. 
and the guardrails you know um the explainable ai is what people are looking at when hey, um, uh ram i just lost your audio for just a second do you mind just saying what you said a couple seconds oh, ago again? Goodness, yes. Internet um, yeah sorry about that uh you were saying about risk management so nist has released something called ai risk management framework it's an open source i would strongly recommend all the startup base to look at that you need to think of the business case you need to think of the risk you need to also think of the explainability you need to think of security and you need to think of the data uh, i have actually asked chat gpt today what would it take to take the llms and make it a tiny model and you are like why am i asking the problem with chat gpt miles is if i put in an excel if i put a powerpoint it will interpret it but where is the data being harvested it's somebody's cloud which means if there's a mistake it will fix it but it could use this to reference somebody else now if it's a public data i'm okay but if it's a very personal and confidential data what happens is why did apple shut down why apple is not allowing chat gpt in their company because if the product design leaks you know what will that will happen so so this is where the risk framework and everything comes and and the definition of ai is changing so you you may be having a great business case but not thinking of the pitfalls you may be subject to liability and one lawsuit is good enough for you to shut down so so let's yeah let's dig in on that a little bit what what's an example of like let's just go th- into a use case like what what's a risk that um, that you can point to a privacy risk or a data risk or a copyright risk, maybe um, that you're thinking that people should be considering. See, um, everything you you just mentioned everything. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> maybe I maybe I've been following the news too. <laughs> um, yeah. So so see this. I, um, um, I'll I'll tell you an example which is good and bad. Um, I was chat gpt hey you know how do you see the digital twins and sustainability coming you know um so the first thing it says is i have mastered my data till september or december 3021 right. this is sustainability you know what not but then i said did you look at the latest news on it then it says no i have not it so as i started feeding about it the good thing is it's trying to learn and start giving me digital twins and sustainability so now what happens is it is looking into the world and based on what i must it's all prompt engineering i don't need to teach you mile it's mm-hmm. prompting and then it's looking around the world and coming back now i think sam altman said that he's going to pump in some 100 million or 100 billion to scan all the ice on planet earth so so what happens is um, i'll say i'm building a net zero protocol and i want to know what the world is thinking so the good side let's take let's take the the good side of it the world is all talking everybody is talking of circular economy even i am talking about it so i am no different uh, so we always have to use the buzzwords which the world loves to use it um and for those who are unaware can you explain circular economies to them so um these are all buzz and hype traditionally our forefathers and fathers and what not have always used products that came from mother earth or nature but as technology so w- what what happened is our forefathers what not the material that came from the food to our consumption everything came from nature and then when we died so did these but they re- recycled and we could get new products that is what circular economies the linear economy is we create synthetic products that are not biodegradable and biocompostable mm. 96% of the human produce today is not biodegradable so what's happening is we're doing landfills and what not what not so all of this material gpt gets it but then let's say hey i'm trying to build a patent which can break some microbes or something that can break the you know the uh, this bio, what do you call this microplastics i i don't know if you've seen yesterday there was one small video where a turtle's neck was cuffed in thread and it is funny that it was raising its flippers to people saying help me help me help me mm. uh it is it, it is funny but i shouldn't say the shame on me it is very sad that how we humans are so merciless 
But what was interesting is the turtle was raising its flippers to say, you know, help me. And the, the, the fisherman cut the thread. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, so let's say somebody said, you know, I want to kill the turtle. I'm just telling it. That's a bad side of it. Chat GPT is now coming a little bit intelligent and saying, you know what, this is offense. I'm not going to do it. But instead of saying kill it, I'll say, you know, I'll choke it. Now, take in mind, I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. I'm just telling it. Right. It, what is happening? It's saying, you know what? Okay, there's a way to do that. So the good side of me is being taken out, but the bad side of it is actually going into it. And what happens is if somebody amplifies Ramesh FI, I'm not <laughs> social amplification, says this is what you know, Chad GP says, somehow it tags me with the context that Ramesh is a bad guy and is choking the turtle. Now what happens? My digital persona is screwed up for the hell of my life. I can never, yeah, ever. I, I think you're, you're touching on a really serious point because, um, uh, you know, we mentioned that chat GBT gets a little bit outdated, but, um, if you checked out like Google Bard, like the, the newer, like Google version of this, which is like, uh, up to date, um, and you ask it about certain figures and certain people and you read what it says, a lot of times it's not correct. It, it hallucinates a little bit. It, it meshes things together. And one of the things I've, I've been using it, um, as you know, I'm working on this fractional executive network at Arcanium, of which you're a part of. So, um, so the founders watching this, you know, hopefully um, are inspired by our conversation. So please, um, I'm, I'm just willing to cut the card and save the turtle. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah, it's not, it's not no, no violence against animals here. Um, <laughs> no violence yeah. against animals. So as I've do done that, one of the things I played with was using um, OpenAI and ChatGPT to um, to pull uh, resumes and LinkedIn profiles and just summarize them in a way that was kind of more action oriented, like bullet points. And one of the things I learned playing with ChatGPT doing that is that it tends to add words that create sentences that are readable, um, but the meaning and intention of those sentences isn't always quite right. They're, they sound they sound intellectual, they sound well, they look well crafted, but when you really think about the meaning, it'll connect things about you and put them in, together in a way that doesn't quite make sense to me as someone who actually has met you or has looked at your profile. And then, um, you know, you look at some more famous examples of that and, and it does this, it hallucinates a little bit. It'll get the trans, for example, Google's is using all the transcripts from YouTube. So it's pulling all of the uh, conversations people have on there and you'll ask it about someone and you'll see that, oh, it's, it's saying that he thinks this thing, but that thing was, um, you know, really said by somebody else in the same video, you know? And so it's conflating opinions. And the problem is that people are going to read it and think that it's true. Um, they're going to start. Yeah, that's a fear of mine. You know, if it's people fear. start, they use it like Google search, and it's not the same, right? So, so. Gen Z and the Gen Y and the Gen Alpha are ninety nine percent dependent on the systems. Our generation, we have switched from the analog. Actually, I would say analog to digital, and now to the four K to eight K. Mm -hmm. So we have certain cognitive capabilities where we look at the systems, but we do take our human cognitive capabilities. And I read one of the articles called M square, which is the human intelligence plus a machine intelligence is equally needed. But what scares me is the creator economy and the kids, the Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen Alpha, 99% of the decisions are based on not M square, just the M intelligence, which is the machine intelligence. So if you are tuned, so I'll tell you the fact is when chat GPT says something, we go and check or we make sure that's right or factual or not. But today's generation, the Gen Y and Gen Alpha, assume that is what it is. So you don't know if there's something fake or original and you assume the fake to be original. And what happens is over a couple of years, the fake becomes so original and you find nothing wrong. And actually when I'm talking to youngsters where I actually mentor some of the kids, they don't think some, anything is wrong because the wrong for them is normal. So the wrong is the new right thing and the right thing becomes the new normal. And then you move into an era where you don't know. And that's the problem that I'm actually seeing with the Gen Y and the Gen Alpha. And how, so I, um, I actually really agree and I share this fear and I'm wondering how do you compare that to um, kind of the fear when I was a child was that, you know, Wikipedia had come out and everybody was saying, oh, don't trust what's on Wikipedia because 
you know, it's just sourced from the community and you don't know if it can be trusted and the citations weren't very good back then. But I think it's fair to say that most of humanity to a large degree does trust Wikipedia now and that the crowd has done a good job of kind of fixing a lot of that data. Do you think that'll happen with these models as well? And, and I guess maybe to tie us back to the startup conversation too, are there any opportunities you see for um, early stage companies maybe to be a player in making this uh, technology more safe for everyone or, or contributing in that way? What I'd like to see in chat GPT is if it's making an inference, if you could put a small hint saying, this is how I've inferred, this is my mm-hmm. bias. I think that it's all about the explainable AI and there are some areas where the risk is there. I think that would be an aha moment where many startups can help because you are making a, a decision based on how the model is. And perhaps you can fine tune the weights and say, now not everybody's tech savvy, but simply saying, you know what, this is how I've inferred it. And this is the citations. Now, people who are interested can go in it, but if you live in this, we live in this goldfish era where the human span of attention is less than eight seconds, and we read, we treat right roughly around you know, 96 papers worth of data in one day. So if somebody who is interested can read it, what I would love to see is chat GPT. You ask if you do a prompt, it gives, and then says some tool tip or something. By the way, this is how I inferred, and this is what my bias, and this is what the risk is. Very simple. That could go in a long way to build trust in the this one. Because, you know, I've read an article where chat GPT was hacked. So now what it creates is this fears of, you know, if that was hacked, then then what I'm seeing is wrong. So I, I think that could actually help in getting some trust in it. Like you said, Wikipedia, when it came, you had this care, but now it's a de facto and it's something the new normal. So what is a trend becomes a new normal after a couple of years. But again, we live in this era of hyper um, I think we are, we are following not the Moore's law, the Wright's law, where everything is exponential. I think with generative AI, it's not exponential. I think it's infinity. That is what is happening. You know, <laughs> exponential seems to be a short word with this generative AI. So you yeah. know, the, the bias and the explanation, if they could be provided, you get to know. And if this was hacked, then that is the next step. But at least an explainable AI with a bias and everything will actually build trust into the system. That's my view, my two cents. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and having played with OpenAI's APIs, um, you know, there is like a confidence score on the tokens and they don't really show that in the chat GPT um, UI. But when you work with the, AI, the API directly, um, you can actually tune it. You can tell it to be, you know, less biased toward hallucination and you can uh, get some confidence back from it. So even just exposing that to the user, it could be, it doesn't have to be hyper-technical, but color-coded, you know, like exactly, code exactly. Stuff, give me green if you've got a hundred percent confidence and give me red if you've got zero percent and let me, you know, let me at least exactly. see what you're doing here because, because currently um, I think most users are just assuming that it's true and that that's very, very dangerous. Um, so uh, Ramesh, this was, um, extremely interesting. And I think we could talk all day about tech and, and current events. I want to leave you with um, one more question that you can use to just kind of speak to a startup audience that may want to work with you. So um, if there's some founders uh, listening and, and, and they want to reach out, um, what kind of uh, engagement would be best for those early stage founders, say like, you know, before they, they uh, get to more growth capital and they're in that MVP, product market fit, discovery phase. Um, what would be the best uh, project for them to engage you with and, and how would they know that you're great, uh, the right fit for them? Um, I definitely hope I'm the right fit, but I can't say I'm the right fit. It all depends on the alignment of the personality and the vision. Um, I, I would say the vision um, than the personality. Uh, personality obviously comes by constant interaction. I think the key to the success is one of the successes is meeting people in person because you get to know the confidence, but that's not possible. Sometimes you may have companies or countries across the geography. Uh, so you may not know. I've had a company from Indonesia call me four or five times, but what I found is it's a scam. 
So, so sometimes you want to do with a benevolent intention, but it may backfire. So the best way is um, reach me on LinkedIn or um, I don't share my number on the public, but uh, after certain conversations. Right, and they can reach you through Arcanium. I, I guess what I meant was, um, was in terms of like industry and space and like, it sounds like you have a very um, passion, a, a, a deep passion for sustainability yes. and for business architecture. Um, so would you be interested, for example, in working with early stage clean tech or green tech or sustainability um, uh, companies? Is that something? I, I've actually been fortunate, like I said, I've actually, I'm actually a mentor for a photographic company. So, <laughs> so I worked in cybersecurity, blockchain, analytics, creative experience, um, the photography company. Um, yes, sustainability is a big thing that I'm looking at. So, um, and I've worked a little bit in the automobile industry too. So um, every, every new sector is something new for them and for us to learn, but the experience has always mattered. So I'm pretty much open to any sector that can contribute to the society and for us. Well, thank you so much, Ramit.